David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, joining us every day at this time. And David, uh, we've been talking a lot here about economic conditions, and more importantly, we've been talking about the resiliency in consumer spending. It's holding up. Yeah, it's, which is great yeah. for the economy, mm -hmm. although the inflation is also holding up yeah. a bit, which is a troubling. But one of the things we look at in Wall Street Week is sort of the longer-term trends. Mm -hmm. One of them is the so-called multipolar world and what that really would make mean for global growth in the long term. So we turn to somebody with a lot of experience both in international economics as well as the private sector. He's Michael Froman. He is now vice chair of MasterCard. He's the former U.S. trade representative. He's about to become president of the Council on Foreign Relations. We asked him whether in the future we're going to have one globe when it comes to trade and investment. The days of what might be called hyper-globalization, where everything was integrated under the WTO into kind of a single rules-based system, that is probably receding. And we are seeing regional arrangements, arrangements of different countries around different sets of issues, uh, what I call plurilateralism, open plurilateralism, which may be the, the, the new frontier of where the global trading system goes. Does that inevitably mean slower growth because there's more friction around the world? It, it will potentially lead to slower growth and higher prices, but I think it's a reflection of the fact that up to now, the whole focus of the global trading system has been around efficiency and the efficient supply chains. That's been good for intermediate inputs that go into manufacturing. It's been good for the consumer who's able to buy more of the basic uh, needs that they have for less of their disposable uh, income. But it does come, and we've seen this not only in the United States but around the world, at the cost of dislocation, and governments have not been terribly uh, well positioned, uh, terribly effective at dealing with the dislocation that comes from that. So now we're seeing people are concerned not just about efficiency, they're, considered, they're worried about resilience, redundancy, they want to move supply chains closer to their markets, more friend shoring, some reshoring back to their back to their home markets. Inevitably, less efficiency means higher prices, and it'll be an interesting experiment to see what people's tolerance is for higher prices in an already inflationary environment. Uh, at least some of the developing countries uh, find that a bit threatening. They hear resiliency, they hear supply chain, and say, that means you're going to take it away from us, and you're going to bring it back domestically or just right next door, like, for, the, for example, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, that leaves out the rest of us. Does it mean necessarily some of the developing country, countries lose? Well, I think it means there'll be some reshuffling. And, and first of all, I don't think we're seeing the wholesale change of global supply chains in their entirety. I think what we're seeing is at the margins when companies are deciding where to put their next plant or how to ensure that they're not overly dependent on one market for production, they'll look for a second or third market to put their next plant and, and, and to expand their, their supply chains. Uh, so Vietnam has been a huge beneficiary in Asia as people have looked beyond China. Malaysia has been a huge beneficiary. And yes, while Mexico and Canada are the most obvious nearshoring for the U.S., Central America, South America, are also benefiting. So I don't think it means a wholesale movement away from developing countries and emerging markets, but it may involve some reordering of the supply chain. What does this mean potentially for Wall Street, if you forgive me, people on Wall Street, but also the companies that are involved? And we knew sort of what the rules were before. We knew the globalization was a good thing, that we could grow our business by going overseas. Is that still the case? Where, where do I invest my money now? <laughs> Uh, that's the safest and the most likely to return profits? I think the environment is going to be much more complex going forward. We already see it. I mean, first of all, we see a return to war uh, in Europe, which is uh, you know, we haven't seen in, in 75 years. Uh, we see a degree of decoupling, although sometimes that's exaggerated, but at least in, over some of the more sensitive technology sectors. Uh, and we see a lot of, of political movement around nationalism and localization requirements that are requiring CEOs and investors to really think through how much more complex the international system is than it used to be. I think we've also seen, coming out of those World Bank IMF meetings a couple of weeks ago, the growth at the global level is, is quite varied. It's not, there's some high growth countries still, uh, there are much slower growth countries, and particularly the developing countries and the emerging economies that have a lot of debt, ran up a lot of debt, particularly around COVID as they were spending money and borrowing to spend money on supporting their, their people and their, their small businesses, those countries are having to deal with that burden in a rising rate environment. And so 
That, I think, is another issue that investors and, and companies are going to have to look at very carefully. How much of a say will China have in all of this? I mean, obviously, the China-U.S. relation is something we talk about every single day. At the same time, even when you talk about, for example, some of the debt right. with some of the less developed countries, uh, China has a lot of that debt. It's not clear what's going to happen with it. How much does China get to determine what the new structure looks like? Well, China is going to be absolutely critical to, to this. One, they still account for a very significant percentage of global growth. And if they're not growing, then the global economy is not going to be able to grow as much uh, either with all the dependence on their, their market and their demand for commodities and other, other products. Uh, secondly, as you said, they are a major creditor, and uh, particularly to developing countries, not just in Asia, but around the world, Africa and elsewhere, uh, owe a lot of money to China. So what role China plays at the table of debt restructuring is going to be absolutely critical. And there's no consensus at this point. There was a big discussion in Washington over the last couple of weeks about that around the IMF World Bank meetings. Would China play a constructive role in restructuring some of their Belt and Road debt and other debt so that these countries could get out from underneath that burden and no resolution was reached. So, so you were USTR. You've dealt in this international arena and in Washington for a long time. As a practical matter, does U.S. have to sort of sort out with China what our rules of the road are between those two countries before you can really move to the rest of the world? Because right now, it's very un unclear exactly where those rules are. I think that's right. I mean, I think, even to take a step further back, we're not having a lot of communication at this point, uh, whether it's about military issues and, and potential areas of conflict around the economic issues and areas of, of how to de-escalate some of the tension that has been created um, while also protecting our, our national economic interests, our national uh, economic security interests, um, as well as on the issues that we need to work together on, whether it's climate change or non-proliferation, uh, North Korea, uh, elsewhere. So uh, first thing first, we've got to get people back to the table. And while there's a broad consensus uh, in Washington and elsewhere about the nature of the challenge that China poses to the U.S., there's much less consensus, much less work being done on what is the new equilibrium that we're trying to achieve with China? What is it going to look like going forward? Is it a, a new Cold War? Is it some other kind of relationship? It's probably not going back to the 70s and 80s and 90s of engagement and hoping that that produces a different result. But we don't know what the new model is.